heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. Caroline Hyde's off this week. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up on the program, full coverage from the World Economic Forum as tech heavyweights descend on Davos. We hear from Sam Altman, Satya Nadella, Mark Benioff and many more. Plus, the US Supreme Court rejects Apple's bid for an epic App Store review. Details ahead on the decision that will likely affect billions of dollars in revenue for the iPhone maker. And Microsoft is announcing the next phase of its co-pilot journey. We'll discuss the news with Microsoft's Executive Vice President, Yusuf Mehdi. Uh, welcome back after a holiday weekend here in the United States. This is what financial markets look like. And we start a shortened week with a lot of Fed speak countering what was Wall Street earnings. The Nasdaq 100 basically flat, softer by a tenth of 1%. But the market now is looking at that Fed speak and saying, actually, let's rethink a little bit how many rate cuts or how deep the rate cuts will be in 2024. And of course, that has an impact on the technology sector and those indices that are relevant. Elsewhere, Bitcoin around 43,000 US dollars per token, kind of stabilizing from the volatility of recent weeks. US 10 year yield hired by 10 basis points. Fed speak all week long. You need to keep across all of that. There's a lot in the news flow as well. And there are three names that we're zeroed in on later in the program. We're going to start off with Tesla. Now in the green have been significantly lower in the open. Musk saying that he wants to negotiate greater voting rights with the board. Microsoft high by six tenths of one percent. Satya Nadella has been speaking in Davos, but also that news that AI Copilot goes from enterprise to the consumer. And we've got a great interview on that. Alphabet shares softer by a tenth of one percent. Reports of more layoffs at specific parts of the company. The big story is Apple. This was the market mover and given Apple's market cap dragging indices to the downside. Softer by one point seven percent. Those declines have been deeper. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court rejecting Apple's appeal of an appeals court decision earlier, uh, an antitrust suit which challenges the App Store. I want to bring in Bloomberg's Mark Gurman, our chief correspondent who leads our coverage of Apple. And Mark, uh, it's hard to understand the legalese here because it's an appeal of an appeal. But explain this morning's news to our audience. Ed, thanks for having me this morning, as always. Yes, yeah, so let me explain. Epic Games, Apple, they were in this major lawsuit a few years ago uh, over the App Store. Apple won most of the lawsuit, right? Apple won in the sense they were not designated a monopoly. But there was one little carve-out that Apple lost on, and that was known as a steering provision. The idea where the judge ruled that Apple should allow developers to include a button inside of their applications to point users external to the App Store to complete their transactions. Now, why is that such a big deal? Because primarily, applications downloaded via the App Store to the iPhone or the iPad have to use Apple's in-app billing system. That takes between a 15% and a 30% cut. In fact, the majority of Apple services revenue likely comes from transactions and in-app purchases made through the App Store. And Apple had been appealing that for the last several months, all the way up to the Supreme Court. Epic had also been appealing their losses in that initial trial in California up to the Supreme Court. Today, Tuesday, the Supreme Court decided they're not going to hear either side. So that means Epic's not going to get what they want. They want Apple to open up the App Store completely in the U.S. They want them to be designated uh, as an antitrust violator, as a monopoly. Apple's not getting what they want. Their appeal here has failed for that carve out, for that external button, for in-app purchases. So we're going to have to wait and see Apple's response here to see when they're going to implement this and exactly how. Uh, the interesting other tidbit here is March 7th is when the Digital Markets Act comes into place. The Digital Markets Act is in the European Union. This is going to require Apple to open up the App Store there, allow outside billing. So it's possible Apple's going to try to, to use that same technology to open up the billing in the U.S. as well. Or they may take another method. We'll have to wait and see. But either way, not great news for Apple this morning, nor Epic. Yeah, we had the European Commission Executive Vice President Margrethe Vestager on with me live last Friday. And, and her message was, well, I'm meeting with Tim Cook. That meeting happened. 
you know you have to comply by March 7th. And what she told me was she was going to explain to Tim Cook and other CEOs how they could comply. Let's get back to the App Store dispute. There's an iOS iPhone user consideration here, a technology consideration, that if the high court puts into effect the appeals court's original decision, you as a developer of an iOS app can, di can direct the consumer elsewhere outside of the iOS ecosystem, right? Just explain, if I'm an iPhone user, what I might see going forward. Yeah, so if you're an iPhone user right now, and let's say you, I'll use Fortnite as an example. Let's say Fortnite was still in the App Store. You want to buy uh, a new character. You want to buy a bundle. So you click that. Maybe it's priced at $10. And traditionally, what you would have to do is use your App Store credentials. You get a pop-up through the App Store. You would uh, approve it with Touch ID, your password, or Face ID. It's $10. $7 of that would go to the developer. $3 would go to Apple. Now, when this comes into effect, that button, maybe you'll be able to go to a website to finish a transaction. Maybe you'll use Stripe, uh, for example. And the vast majority, in that case, of the revenue will then go to the developer. Stripe charges maybe 3 and 4%. Maybe it goes through PayPal. They take a few percentage points. So it's going to mean less revenue for Apple, more revenue for the developer. Now, there is a scenario here where even if apps can point developers to collect payments outside of the App Store, Apple could still have a method to collect that payment from the developer. Maybe the developer at the end of each month needs to write Apple a check. Uh, this is something they've done with dating apps in the Netherlands. That has required a similar rule, but Apple is still trying to collect that money. Instead of charging a 30% fee, they charge something like 26 or 27%, so taking out that processing fee from there too. So it is going to be very interesting to see how Apple implements this, I would imagine, as they should. Uh, they will implement it in the way that's most advantageous to their bottom line. All right, Bloomberg's Mark Gurman, our chief correspondent who leads our coverage of Apple. Thank you very much. A really complex story that has every twist and turn you could imagine. Now, coming up here on the program, we get the macro outlook for the tech sector with Erica Clower. She's a portfolio manager for the PGM Jenison Technology Fund. Holds a lot of chip stocks, but also, by the way, a holder of Apple shares. We'll get her reaction to a pretty new, big news story this morning. From San Francisco, this is Bloomberg Technology. Let's get back to markets and our top stories, because on this Tuesday, they're inextricably linked. Joining us, Erica Clower, portfolio manager for the P. Jim Jenison Technology Fund. Jenison Associates, a $186 billion active asset manager that takes a bottom-up fundamental long-term investment approach. And I think when I look at your portfolio specifically, Erica, if the story of 2023 was the Magnificent Seven, you're pretty closely aligned with those, one of them being Apple. You will have seen the news this morning of the Supreme Court's decision to reject Apple's appeal of the appeals court original decision. When you hold a stock like Apple and you consider its services revenue, how do you think about the news story of this morning in terms of the attractiveness of that name? Sure. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, you know, Apple has been a long time holding of Jenison Associates. And we look at the business as one that is extraordinarily sticky. Uh, companies who use Apple products and consumers who use Apple products tend to have a difficult time switching over to other platforms. And as a result, the sustainability of the services business is incredibly attractive. Certainly, if you look on the hardware side of the part of the business, there is more competition. There also is saturation and maturity in that business. So really what drives our investment decision is the sustainability of that services business. Uh, Erica, the other big story of the morning which we have to discuss is FedSpeak. In fact, it will, will probably be uh, the, the speak of the week. And, and Fed Governor Waller is kind of front and center, basically saying the Fed may need to cut rates this year, emphasis on this year, depending on inflation, but there is no need to go as deep or as fast uh, as historically a Fed might have done. How does that inform your view of the technology sector? Sure. Well, Jenison is a uh, bottoms-up research house, and so we tend to look at companies 
over a longer period of time, looking at the duration and sustainability of the company's competitive advantages. But one of the critical factors that goes into our decision making at Jenison is really looking at the ability of technology companies to be deflationary over time. And we think that is going to be more important than ever over the next three to five years as companies are able to use AI to bring down their costs, to increase their productivity um, to an extent that we do not think is properly discounted in many of the share prices today. Two of your biggest holdings are NVIDIA and I believe also Broadcom. You know, we go back to that Magnificent Seven discussion of last year. Are those solely AI stories to your mind? Great question. We at Jenison Associates have owned NVIDIA since 2016 and Broadcom about the same time period. And the reason for the duration of those holdings is that we look to those companies as key enablers within artificial intelligence deployment. Certainly NVIDIA is more of a pure play in that arena. Broadcom is a little bit different in the sense that it not only has uh, AI ASIC parts, custom parts that it makes for hyperscalers such as Google, but it also has a very strong portfolio of networking products that we think are going to be essential within the AI ecosystem. And beyond that, they have very strong market share in many other semiconductor businesses that may be more mature, but the company has extraordinary pricing power that has sustained over the last decade and we think will extend for the next decade as well. Uh, another name that you hold is AMD, the stock currently up almost 8%, putting it on track for its biggest jump since early December. A lot of analysts have been updating their price targets on this name. I, I sat down with Lisa Sue when they kind of fully launched the MI300X and started to really build up their AI story and boost their forecasts. It's the same question. Do you see AMD as an AI play or something broader? Well, as you point out, AMD is one of the top holdings at Jenison Associates. And the reason for that is not only do we think that the company has a very viable and important product portfolio to address the AI opportunities, but we also look to the PC segment, which may not be getting so much attention as AI does today because it's not as exciting. It's a more mature industry. But I think that there is going to be an important multi-year upgrade cycle to AI PCs. And there AMD is very well positioned to continue to gain market share and increase its average selling prices. So we think the combination of those two markets, along with its very strong portfolio of programmable logic devices, which goes into different end markets, is going to push advanced micro devices earnings higher than expectations for the next several years. Erica, I think one thing that many of those chip names have in common, other than the sort of battleground for high performance GPU, is exposure to China. Mm. And there is the policy side of this where the US has clear export controls and restrictions of technology to China. And then there's the politics side of it. And I believe that one of China's vice premiers this morning was trying to say, like, look, we need open access to technology. As an investor, where do you position yourself within that? This is a great question. I would say that the biggest concern that we have at Jenison at this point is the strain on relations with China vis-a-vis -vis the ability for there to be technology innovation. Undoubtedly, the world is much more globally interconnected with regards to technology deployment, innovation, and supply chain. With there being so much more frankly, tension between the U.S. and China. This is an area that gives us a lot of concern. We still believe that the pace of innovation will continue, but we are monitoring the situation very tightly. As one example, the biggest foundry in the world, the biggest maker of semiconductors in the world for other companies is Taiwan Semiconductor. If TSMC's supply chain is disrupted, that would harm the entire technology industry and, frankly, the global economy. So this is a very important issue that we are monitoring at Jenison. Erica Clow, Portfolio Manager for the PGM Jenison Technology Fund. A lot of covered ground there. Very wide knowledge base. Great discussion. Good to have you on the program. Now, coming up, we're going to get more from Davos. That's coming up next here. This is Bloomberg Technology.
Okay, it's time for Talking Tech. And first up, Saudi Arabia's sovereign wealth fund, the Public Investment Fund, is planning to make big investments in both the semiconductor and space industries this year. That's according to its Minister of Communications. The kingdom has been ramping up efforts to diversify its economy away from oil. And speaking of semiconductors, chip design company Synopsys has agreed to buy software developer Ansys for about $34 billion in cash and stock according to an announcement by the companies. The deal is set to expand Synopsys's customer base and its suite of products. Plus, Netflix is testing a joint plan with French retailer Carrefour in a pilot project to win more customers to its cheapest subscription, mimicking a model used by Amazon to boost its streaming customers. If enough users sign up to the trial, Carrefour said it will expand the offer to its customers all across France. Okay, so the World Economic Forum is underway in Davos, and OpenAI CEO Sam Altman joined Bloomberg's Brad Stone to discuss the upcoming election and the influence AI could have on jobs. Have a listen. I think there's a lot at stake at this election. I think elections are, you know, huge deals. I believe that America is going to be fine no matter what happens in this election. I believe that AI is going to be fine no matter what happens in this election, and we will have to work very hard to make it so. Um, but this is not, you know, no one wants to sit up here and like hear me rant about politics, so I'm going to stop after this. <laughs> um, but I think there has been a real failure to sort of learn lessons about what, what's kind of like working for the citizens of America and what's not. There are political figures in the US and around the world like Donald Trump, who have successfully tapped into a feeling of you know, dislocation, uh, anger of the working class, the feeling of you know, exacerbating inequality or uh, technology leaving people behind. Is there the danger that uh, you you know, know, AI furthers those trends? Yes, for sure. I think that's something to think about. But one of the things that surprised us very pleasantly on the upside, because uh, you know, when you start building a technology, you start doing research, you kind of say, well, we'll follow where the science leads us. And then when you put a product, you'll say, this is going to co-evolve with society, and we'll follow where users lead us. But it's not, you get, you get to steer it, but only somewhat. There's some which is just like, this is what the technology can do. This is how people want to use it. And this is what it's capable of. And this has been much more of a tool than I think we expected. It is not yet, and again, in the future, it'll, it'll get better, but it's not yet like, replacing jobs in the way, or to the degree that people thought it was going to. It is this incredible tool for productivity. And you can see people magnifying what they can do um, by a factor of two or five, or in some way that doesn't even talk to, makes sense to talk about a number because they just couldn't do the things at all before. And that is, I think, quite exciting. This, this new vision of the future that we didn't really see when we started. We kind of didn't know how it was going to go, and very thankful the technology did go in this direction but where this is a tool that magnifies what humans do, lets people do their jobs better, lets the AI do parts of jobs, and of course jobs will change, and of course some jobs will totally go away, but the human drives are so strong in the sort of way that society works is so strong that I think, and I can't believe I'm saying this because it would have sounded like an ungrammatical sentence to me at some point, but I think AGI will get developed in the reasonably close-ish future and it'll change the world much less than we all think. It'll change jobs much less than we all think. And again, that sounds, I may be wrong again now, but that wouldn't have even compiled for me as a sentence at some point, given my conception then of how EGI was going to go. As you've watched the technology develop, have you both changed your views on how significant the job dislocation and disruption will be as AGI comes into focus? You know, you hear a coder say, OK, I'm like two times more productive, three times more productive, whatever, than they used to be. And I like can never code again without this tool. You mostly hear that from the younger ones. But um, it turns out, and I think this will be true for a lot of industries, the world just needs a lot more code than we have people to write right now. And so it's not like we run out of demand. It's that people can just do more. Expectations go up, but ability goes up, too. That was OpenAI's Sam Altman. Let's stick with Davos. Brad Stone also caught up with Salesforce CEO Mark Benioff to discuss the kinds of disruptive changes we can expect with AI. Have a listen. I think this idea that companies like OpenAI or uh, Microsoft and others want to create digital people that can do all kinds of tasks that we do. Um, you know, will they be taxed? How they'll be re regulated? What are the dangers involved? 
all of these kind of important questions. At the same time, we want to have these incredible benefits of AI that we're all experiencing, better health care, better education, you know, augmentation of our, yep. Let me tell you an incredible story where I was just in Milan with Gucci and uh, they brought us in to work on their call center and very excited. How do we use AI? How do we create better customer service? Um, well, we don't really know what is their end goal. Is it more productivity? You know, is it just better customer relationships? Is it higher margins? Do they want to reduce staff? Do they want to increase staff? But when we apply the technology that we're seeing now, what we saw was the current state of AI, which is really the ability to augment human being, human performance. Revenues went up 30% because these individuals who are call center service agents also then simultaneously became sales agents, marketing agents. They were able to do all these things that they just could not do before. And that's a tremendous theme, I think, that's going on. I feel that way myself, you know, when I'm with uh, ChatGPT or Copilot or Anthropic Cloud or whatever it is, Mr. All, I get that same feeling. Oh, wow, I've got a little bit more capability than I had before because I'm being augmented through AI. And I'm sure it's true in a lot of disciplines. Uh, certainly it's true in healthcare, and it's going to be true in a lot more things. But we're on an arc, and we all know that, that you know, there, it's going to start to be able to do things that will be fundamentally a surrogate for what we all do today. And, and what will determine whether a company can be successful with AI or not? How long will it be until I come to Davos to be interviewed by the Bloomberg AI? That's what I really <laughs> oh, want to know. I'm getting replaced? Well, maybe, you know. I mean, we've, I been doing, we've been doing this together for a long time, right? What, a couple decades, few decades? I'm not that old, but okay. <laughs> but you know what I mean, where it's like, you know, I don't, I don't know. We, you know. Will we get to this point where there's not just all of us in the room, but there's an AI as well participating <laughs> in this conversation and we're about to create digital people, digital salespeople, digital service people, digital marketing people. That was Salesforce CEO and Chair Mark Benioff explaining that my boss Brad Stone and maybe me one day will be replaced by AI. Let's see. Coming up on the program, Microsoft is opening up its AI assistant to consumers. We'll be joined by Microsoft's executive vice president on that. A story that we're tracking coming from Business Insider. Google is reportedly laying off hundreds of employees in its advertising sales team. The stock a little softer, three-tenths of one percent, have been positive earlier in the session. This is according to a memo sent by Phil Schindler, the commercial chief that Insider uh, has seen, although Bloomberg has not verified the report. No causal link, but the shares a little softer. This is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. Ed Ludlow here in San Francisco. A quick check-in on the markets, and we've kind of had a choppy session. Look at the Nasdaq 100. We're softer by three-tenths of one percent. The Fed and Fed speak is a big driver of this market. Uh, Fed Governor Waller speaking at an event this morning saying two critical things. There's no reason to move as quickly or cut as rapidly as in the past. And the market's kind of rethinking its bets for how quickly and how deeply the Fed may cut rates, which impacts the technology sector. Of course, the other thing as well, he, uh, Fed Waller using the, the language Fed can cut this year rather than saying a specific month or upcoming meeting. Then there are the removers. You know, we're soft to three tenths of one percent on the Nasdaq 100. But mega caps are doing some of the work to lift up the index. One of those names being Microsoft. It's paired some of its earlier gains in the session, but we are up three tenths of one percent. Why? Well, Satya Nadella speaking on stage in Davos, but also some news on what Microsoft's doing with AI. Microsoft is now opening up its AI assistant co-pilot to consumers with access to OpenAI's latest chat GPT technology and image creation features. The company also announced it's making the corporate version available to smaller companies and SMEs. Delighted to say we're joined by Microsoft's corporate or executive vice president, Yusuf Mehdi, for more on this. Uh, Yusuf, good morning to you. Th this is a substantive step, right? Because you think about all of the people around the world that use some form of Microsoft software in their daily life. How is Copilot now going to be integrated to that if you're an everyday technology user? 
Yeah, morning, Ed. Um, yeah, this is a, a significant step. I mean, we've been kind of a, on a whirlwind with Microsoft Copilot. We've had now over 5 billion chats with people using AI in their daily lives. And so today we take the next step by bringing more features and expanding more capabilities for people. First in the Copilot that we offer broadly, we're going to enable new capabilities with a premium subscription called Microsoft Copilot Pro. And that gives creators, researchers, writers, um, analysts, programmers, the ability to have the very latest AI models, but also the ability to have AI within Microsoft apps now for the very first time. So they can use it in Outlook, they can use it in Word to write documents, they can use it in PowerPoint, uh, and we're providing premium things like the ability to build custom GPTs. We're also going to make it available to businesses of all sizes. So small businesses can now get access to Copilot and Microsoft 365. Yusuf, a, a really simple question that investors have had and industry analysts have always had is, these tools are fantastic. How do they help you make money alongside how you traditionally uh, sell office tools direct to the consumer or to smaller businesses away from the enterprise business? Yeah, there's really a couple different ways, Ed. You know, and it, I would say first and foremost, it's really early in the stages, but the biggest software market, uh, biggest is the online advertising business, the search business. And we've clearly seen now with AI and with Microsoft Copilot that that is changing. And we're seeing more people come to use our services, whether it's Copilot, whether it's Microsoft Edge, Microsoft Bing, we're growing share. And so that advertising market is an opportunity. And then today with Copilot Pro, the premium subscription service, we're able to unlock enhanced AI capabilities in our Microsoft 365 subscription, of which we have now over 70 million people. So that we have an ability to grow through a variety of different business models, and most importantly, help people in their lives be more creative. I always think about the education side of this, Yusuf. You know, there are people that will have always used Excel or Word, you know, in the course of their daily life or their, their business. But we, we kind of make the assumption in the first instance that all of us will find a co-pilot tool intuitive. We'll just know how to use it. And I wondered if your experience at Microsoft is that that's actually the case. How quickly do you think it will be adopted by users and do you think that they understand how it works? Uh, it's a great question, Ed. I mean, we're clearly in the early days. And so in some cases, um, for some people, it's immediately intuitive, just like people learn to use two thumbs when they were uh, a smartphone came out. And for other of us, it takes a little bit more time to pick it up. But in general, it is quite intuitive. You know, the fact that you can essentially use, use plain English, use, you know, natural language. If you're on your phone, you can even just speak to it. Uh, and you can start to ask it questions. And very quickly, you can start to find some of the magic. And once you find the magic, it really is pretty incredible. You know, I've had a bunch of examples where I've been able to take, my son had to get an MRI for his shoulder. Uh, I didn't understand all of it. I put it into uh, our co-pilot and it came back with plain English. Uh, I was able to help do a, create an image of a design I wanted to do to do a part of our remodel on the house. Um, and that just made that instantaneous. And as you find those magical scenarios, you just kind of naturally want to seek it out and use it more, kind of like the early days of search, where people didn't know quite how to search and now people are quite facile with it. I, I am really interested in the SME uh, or small business part of this equation because we're kind of debating, well, will we or will we not have a recession? What is the health of the small and medium-sized business, particularly in North America, but globally? You know, it, it can be a big decision to invest in a piece of software or a piece of infrastructure how do you see that rollout with SMEs and what's the feedback been in the first instance? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I mean, in the history of the world, there's really two things that drive growth. It's population growth and productivity enhancement. That'll drive GDP. Uh, you know, for the growth here, the ability to have AI within Microsoft Office apps, which is the key tool for how businesses operate. Uh, we think there's great opportunity there, great benefits. You know, what we've seen so far in what we've launched with Copilot for our enterprise customers is on average they're saving about a half an hour a week uh, to an hour. That's so valuable. 77% of them say they would never go back. I believe we can do that here. And today's announcement is so profound because of all businesses, 99.9% .9 of them are small businesses. So we really do see an opportunity here. And I think it can help a lot with some of the world challenges like you talked about because I think this productivity will lead to more GDP growth and will be a benefit for everybody who can access the technology. 
Uh, Yusuf, I'm looking down at my screen on the Bloomberg terminal and I've got all of the world's most valuable companies listed. And number one right now is Microsoft and number two is Apple, something that happened Friday from a market cap perspective. Uh, it was something we were waiting for. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a ride over the last 12 months. The story for Microsoft really driven by AI. I just wondered if I could get your reaction to Microsoft being the most valuable company in the world and why you think that that happened. Um, well, look, I, I think the first thing, everyone here at Microsoft, we're very humble about the opportunity in front of us, uh, the work we have to do to meet our customer needs. And so um, I would say more than anything, we're really focused on what is this magical opportunity for AI? And I think that is, to your point, that's what's led to, I think, people seeing the opportunity that, that this company can do. Uh, and we're, um, you know, we're very focused on trying to make that happen. I think AI is going to be one of the most empowering tools that any of us get to use in our lives bigger than the phone, bigger than the internet, bigger than even the PC. And we're quite excited about what we can do uh, as we build on some of the announcements we have today. Uh, Yusuf Mehdi, Microsoft Executive Vice President, President. It's great to have you on the program. It's good to catch up and happy new year to you into 2024. Now let's head back to Davos and, well, Yusuf's boss, Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella, joined Bloomberg's Brad Stone for a conversation about the relationship between Microsoft and OpenAI in the aftermath of what was a tumultuous November for the AI company. Have a listen to this. You don't go into any partnership. First of all, there is independence in a partnership. There are two different companies uh, answerable to a, two sets of different stakeholders with different interests. So therefore, uh, you have to then create a commercial partnership in it uh, that is mutually beneficial. So that's why I think partnerships where you enter into partnerships where one side is trying to take advantage of the other is not long-term stable. Uh, but if two partners can, uh, and that's sort of why I go back to the history uh, of enterprise value that was created, uh, with partnerships that at least I've been involved in across my career of, uh, at Microsoft. So yes, I think uh, you have to sort of, I feel very, very good about the construct we have. Um, I feel at the same time very capable of uh, controlling our own destiny. Uh, so it's not like uh, that we are single-threaded even today on uh, Azure. It, and, and, and this is not about even open AI. It's all about reflection of what our customers want. Every customer who comes to Azure, for example, in fact, our own products, it's not about one model. We care deeply about having the best frontier model, which happens to be, for example, today, GPT-4. Uh, but we also have Mixtral as, uh, uh, as a model as a service inside of Azure. We use uh, Llama in places. We have Pi, which is the best SLM from Microsoft. Uh, so there is going to be diversity of capability and models that we will have, that we will invest in. Uh, but we will partner very, very deeply with OpenAI. What is the right operating model for a company like OpenAI. I mean, currently it's a capped for-profit company owned by a nonprofit, a very unorthodox arrangement, probably contributed to some of the drama and instability in November. Have they figured it out yet? Are you comfortable now that you've got a partner with a stable operating model? You're talking to Sam later. I am, and I but, will ask him yeah, that as so well. He, I'm, a, I'm you know, asking he, for your opinion. You know, he's the, he, he, he needs to answer that question, and his board, obviously, and I, I'm sure they're working through it. Look, I, 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 I always say this, which is we invested, we partnered when they were whatever they were or, and whatever they are today, right, in terms of uh, being a capped profit, non-profit, what have you. Um, so I'm comfortable. I have no issues with any structure. What we just want is good stability, uh, and and as I said, we don't even need. Like I'm not even interested in a board seat, or we don't need. We, we definitely don't have control. We have no. Uh, we just want to have a good commercial partnership, and we want to be investors in the entity in even uh, the way they're structured. So uh, what I would like is good governance and real stability. Mm -hmm. That's it. That was Satya Nadella, CEO of Microsoft. Now coming up as the generative AI talk of the town in Davos is underway. We're going to have more on exactly that. And look at the investing side in startups and private markets. Excel partner Sarah Elderson coming up next. This is Bloomberg Technology. What we're doing is we're addressing some of the most profound social 
challenges with AI in ways that are transformative. So to give you a couple of examples, um, I think that one of the extraordinary places for all of us, and we've heard a lot about it here over lunch, is healthcare. And part of the reason is it's the ability with AI to aggregate so much data that you can actually have a level of diagnosis that is better than what specialists can do. That was Alphabet President, CFO and CIO Ruth Porat there commenting on the future of AI in a conversation with David Rubenstein at Bloomberg House in Davos. Let's talk more about the impact of AI, generative AI in particular, in today's VC Spotlight with Sarah Idelson, partner at Excel. She focuses on early stage consumer enterprise and AI companies for the firm. And we've kind of swapped places in a way you usually hear, but you're in New York City. Exactly. Uh, the, <laughs> you're hosting you know, me in your lovely studio, so thank you for having me. No, it's, it's always good to have the firm on the show. Here's the thing. The question's always, are we overhyping all of this? I start the show at 9 a.m. Pacific time, and by 10 a.m. Pacific time, I've said the words AI a thousand times. Your thesis seems to be, to be based on the opposite, mm -hmm. that we are not overhyping this at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I think from our perspective, if anything, it's underhyped, which I know is hard to imagine with how many times, even just sitting here in the studio before this segment, I've heard AI uh, countless times. But really, our perspective is it's, it's worthy of that attention because it's just that transformational and it's going to have a really enormous impact on the economy and productivity. And that's why we're so excited to, to see what's possible and be investing in this category at the earliest days. You know, when, when an event like Davos is on, you know, you have Satya Nadella, Microsoft, Ruth Porat of, of Alphabet, parent of Google, Sam Altman of OpenAI, there's still an argument that at least leadership in the field of artificial intelligence as it relates to the building of large language models of generative AI is dominated by the big few. Mm. And so there's a question mark about some of the names we're showing right now, right? Some of your portfolio companies that are a little smaller. How would you respond to that? Yeah, I think, you know, access to this technology is only getting easier and easier. I think over the past year, we watched as some of the building blocks were a little more rudimentary. And now the interface to engage with it is getting easier and easier. And so I think that's a really incredible time for startups to be building in this space. Uh, so I don't think it's at all something that, you know, only only the big guys uh, have the opportunity. I think there's a lot of opportunity for the small ones. One of those names on that board is, is Scale, which is a company we invested in back in 2016. It's really the data engine for every large language model out there. And, you know, that was an incredibly small team just a few years ago. And now it's an, an enormous business that's really fundamental to this space. So there's definitely opportunity for new businesses in this category. What I find very interesting about those leading in the space is their capital needs. You know, there is still a heavy spend on compute and talent. You know, as, as an investor in a scale, how much does that concern you or do you think about uh, the capital needs of a company like that? Yeah, I think it really depends on the business model, and it's about right-sizing the investment for the opportunity. But I think something that's really exciting is that a lot of the conversation over the past year was about these enormous generalized models. And I think what we're beginning to see is these more specialized applications for particular enterprise opportunities. You don't need to mine all the world's data, all the world's knowledge to do a particular job very well. But doing a particular job very well can mean enormous value to a business. And so I'm really excited about opportunities within the enterprise applying more specialized AI to really have a big impact on their bottom line. Uh, Sarah, I just got back from CES Las Vegas, and one of the conversations I had was with L'Oreal CEO Nicolas Réonimus, and, and it was about the use of AI in the hardware context for analyzing your skin. And, and the thesis that, that L'Oreal presents is that that can really boost sales because your chance of conversion is really high when you have a data set driven by AI. You can really convince the consumer. You are in New York City. Uh, because of the National Retail Federation. So join those dots as well. Yeah. Retail and AI. 
Absolutely. I, I mean, I had a similar experience probably to you at CES where walking the halls of NRF, it is incredibly abuzz with the applications of AI within retail and commerce. I'm here supporting one of my investments, which is a company called Syrup. They're focused on inventory optimization for brands. So getting the right item to the right place at the right time. This is sort of the holy grail for retail. It's what really drives margin if you can sell more while producing less. It also improves the sustainability and what has historically been a really wasteful category and it's just a perfect example of what I was just describing of a very specialized AI application to solve an incredibly gnarly enterprise challenge and they're improving forecast north of 40 percent with some of their customers that's really going to drive the bottom line they're working with folks like Reformation Abercrombie and Fitch so it's just a perfect example of how AI is really going to trans transform every category in in business and I think retail is an enormous one, and it's been really exciting to be here at NRF. You know, almost 10 years ago, I remember being in Europe speaking to Philippe Boteri of Excel. You know, you're a firm that I've known for a long time across, like, pre-seed right to very late growth stage. Mm -hmm. And I want to know right now where the focus of the activity is or the opportunity in AI, if there is still, you know, new companies being formed that are being opportunistic to enter the space? Oh man, there's activity at every stage. I'm biased because I do early stage investing and so I spend a majority of my time, you know, at, at Seed and Series A, but also honestly meeting sort of pre-founders. You know, that's really been the ethos of Excel is we want to be the first partner and that may be when you're just dreaming up something uh, and, and if it's possible. So I think there's opportunity at every stage, but this has really been such a transformational moment, having this sort of new technology that in the hands of really you know, passionate, brave technologists, they can do incredible things they couldn't before. And so that's just an amazing time to be at the earliest days of, of sort of seed in Series A where I spend my time. Sarah Edelson, partner at Excel, normally in SF, today in New York City. Great to have you. It's on snowing the program. here. Thank you. <laughs> Great conversation. This is Bloomberg Technology. One of YouTube's biggest stars has posted his first video on X. Billionaire Elon Musk celebrated the move by reposting a video created by Mr. Beast, who has 230 million plus YouTube subscribers. The YouTube star posted on X, quote, I'm curious how much ad revenue a video on X would make. So I'm re-uploading this to test it. We'll share ad rev next week. And I know that Linda Yaccarino, the CEO of X, behind the scenes at CES, was doing a lot with influencers and talent agencies in that vein. Now, sticking with Musk, the Tesla CEO leaned on the company's board to arrange another massive stock award for him years after he had sold a significant chunk of his shares in the company to acquire Twitter. There's more to it than that. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Craig Trudell. Uh, Craig, what Elon is saying is he can't negotiate new pay, but his rationale is he wants greater voting rights. Yeah, I, I think it's kind of incredible that, you know, we're just a few weeks removed from this guy talking about, you know, uh, advertising, uh, excuse me, advertisers uh, blackmailing him at, at uh, X. Uh, I don't think it's a stretch to say that's kind of what he's doing here with, with Tesla. He's saying that if he doesn't own more of the company, he will essentially take uh, his work on AI elsewhere, which is incredible for a, a few reasons. The fact that he's already started uh, a separate AI company called XAI, and the fact that he's been working on AI and robotics at Tesla for years now. He's you know, talked about the company being more than just a car maker, uh, being a leader in real world AI, as he puts it. And so, you know, it's, it's really uh, kind of incredible what we've seen play out just in the last few days uh, on X of all places. All right, Bloomberg's Craig Trudeau out of London. Thank you so much. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Short week, but we're not short of news. Don't forget to check out our podcast wherever you get your podcasts, iHeart, Spotify, and on Apple, as well as the Bloomberg platforms. From a rainy SF and a snowy New York City, this is Bloomberg Technology.